her husband, John. Most of you already do, um, but you may know Maureen and John from their role with the Confederation of Union Generals, a living history group focused on the Civil War, where the couple portrays Lieutenant General Winfield Scott and his wife, Maria. As such, Maureen has also presented on fashion of the Civil War period. Maureen has experience as an English teacher and administrative assistant in the doctoral programs at Marywood College and is currently a paralegal at Heart Law. Today, Maureen brings her knowledge of fashion and culture online to talk about bridal fashion and wedding culture. She came by her interest in wedding gowns from her first job on the old Scrantonian Tribune newspaper, where she was assigned to the social department and wrote almost every wedding article from 1972 to 1990. Later, Maureen was the editor and publisher of Wedding Day magazine, which covered bridal trends in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Talk a little bit about wedding dresses and wedding culture itself. Um, throughout history, until the 19th century at least, um, weddings were essentially business deals. Lower class men married women who were strong enough to work in the fields and bear healthy children. Upper classes married to cement alliances and increased wealth and to provide heirs. Love did not enter into, into the picture as couples exchanged vows. By the 19th century, romance began to play more of a role, including the marriage of Queen Victoria of England to Prince Albert. Historical Brides looks at the evolution of wedding gowns as we know them today. From before and after Victoria, through the gay 90s and the roaring 20s, World War II, the glamorous 50s, swinging 60s, the excesses of the 80s through today. You may see something that's familiar to you, um, whether good or bad, um, based on your opinion of, of what your, your own wedding looked like. Um, so Maureen, take it away, um, and I'll be sharing the screen, so you may have to kind of bear with us a little bit as we're, as we're going here. I want to give a little introduction of my own to, to put this into context, um, because I know there's an awful lot going on in the world right now, and, and wedding dresses may not seem like an important subject. This presentation I actually put together for a tea that was held last September that ran in conjunction with a wedding gown exhibit that Sarah curated actually and did a beautiful job with. And it featured dresses from the first ladies of Scranton, meaning all the mayor's wives going back quite a while and also dresses from the Scranton family. And I forget how, how far back they went, but 19th century. We had, we had them to about, 1835 was the earliest dress that, that we had from Jane Scranton. Right. So um, I put together this presentation. I didn't actually deliver the presentation. My stepdaughter, Elizabeth McDonald, did at that time. Um, but here I am today. And um, we're going to show you a PowerPoint presentation on the, the uh, weddings through history. So whenever you're ready, Sarah. Yep. It's called Weddings Through History. Can you all hear me, I hope? Um, the white wedding gown most brides wear today is very much a newcomer in Western culture. In the past, as Sarah said, most brides could not afford to wear a dress for one day only, especially in an impractical shade like white, and so they wore their best dresses, whatever the color. Queen Victoria is often credited with introducing and popularizing the white bridal gown when she married Prince Albert in 1840. But this is not entirely true. Women of privilege had worn white dresses in the past, as you will soon see. What Victoria did was to make the romantic white or cream colored dress the stuff of every bride's dreams. Before Victoria, no, go back, go back. Before and even after Victoria, marriages were usually arranged and involved the exchange of property between two families. They were essentially business deals. Elaborate dresses were seen throughout history as an easy way to show one's riches, if indeed you were rich. At the left, you will see a bride in a painting titled The Marriage, painted sometime during the 1350s. This bride is seen celebrating with musicians and friends and wearing a pale orange dress. This would have, again, been designed to show her wealth. In the center is a portrait from 1630 by the artist John Paul Rubens showing his own bride in her wedding finery, which was a combination of gold brocade and an overlay of black velvet. At the right, 
is a sumptuous white bridal gown worn by Sophia Magdalene of Denmark in 1766. It's a little bit wide, as you can see. And it also shows that Victoria was not the first bride to wear white after all, nor the first royal bride to do so. Okay. Here on the left is an English wedding dress from 1775, which is very similar to the white Danish gown and they're about a decade apart. Uh, in the center is a dress from colonial America. Although it is of the same time frame as the previous two white dresses, it's very different in style and color. During the 18th century, blue was a popular choice as it represented chastity, but brides would also choose green, red, yellow, or any other color, or even prints, as you can see in this center dress. At the right is a beautifully preserved wedding gown which was worn by Princess Charlotte of England uh, several decades later in 1813. Charlotte made a big splash with a gown made of silver lame over a silver tissue slip, embroidered at the bottom with shells and flowers. Unfortunately, this lovely princess died four years later in 1817 during childbirth, a very sad event in England, which subsequently led to Victoria becoming queen a few decades after that. It changed the line of the succession. Okay. And here we have Victoria. By the time Victoria married, the mass production of textiles had lowered the cost of fabrics. However, the cost of making a dress remained high, with the result that a woman's wedding dress continued to serve as her best dress during the early years of her marriage. Thus, the average bride did not opt for white. At the left is Victoria's actual gown, which has since faded from the pale cream shade that made such a hit back in 1840. The dress is fashioned of heavy silk satin trimmed with Honiton lace featuring a deep flounce at the neckline. In the center, you can see a portrait of Victoria wearing her veil. It was held by a wreath of orange flower blossoms instead of a tiara. She also wore a sapphire brooch given to her by Prince Albert for the occasion of their wedding, which you can see here pinned to her bodice. And her beautiful matching cream slippers can be seen in the photo to the right can see the ribbon trim, how pretty that is. Okay, we'll move ahead from 1940 to brides of the 1850s. With Queen Victoria's example and influence, you can see similar styles of gowns followed in the 1850s. At the left is one with a high neckline and a tiered skirt, which is a style very, very popular in the 50s, 1850s. In the center, the bride wears a veil over her bonnet. And at the right is a very romantic looking bride carrying a fan and with a neckline very similar to that of Victoria's dress. Civil War brides. Here are a variety of dresses worn during the Civil War era. The dress on the left retains many of the features of Victoria's dress, including the flower trim but it is worn with a fuller hoop skirt, which was, of course, very popular during the Civil War period. The center dress is also typical of the era. This one has a high neckline closed with a brooch. And the dress on the right is a later design with a scoop neckline and flowers at the bodice. We move ahead a decade to 1870s and we find that the gowns are far more slender since hoop skirts became a thing of the past. These dresses remain very fancy with lots of trim. The emphasis is placed at the back of the skirt. If you notice the long train and fabric draped up into bustles with lots of flounces. The waist is lower than in the 1860s with an elongated and tight bodice and the front of the skirt is flat completely different from 1860s. The gay 90s. 
Before the turn of the century, gowns were less flounced and more demure, although sleeves can widely vary as seen in these examples. In the gay 90s, the bodice was cut extremely narrow in the shoulders with thick gathers of pleats and it was full over the bosom. This is the era of the Gibson girl where they favored teeny tiny waistlines. Look at that girl in the middle. You can see all the different sleeves that were worn during this period. Right on the right, I think, is Jen Ackman's doppelganger. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Looks just like Jen, actually. <laughs> I snuck it in there. <laughs> okay. Um, lest you think Victoria's example seen in all those previous photos caused every bride to switch to white dresses, I do want you to see that very often through the years, brides opted for dark colors or even black. These colors were practical and the dresses could be used again and again. Especially during the Depression and the war years, many women reverted to practical and inexpensive ensembles. At the left, we see a style from the turn of the century, a dark dress, but worn with a long white veil. At the center is a bride. She's looking older and very solemn in a shorter dress and a wide brimmed hat. While the twenties bride at the right wears a stylish white headpiece and veil with a slender dark dress and a very large bouquet. By the advent of the 20th century, styles became a mixture of very traditional long gowns with lots of lace and long veils to ankle length ensembles and hats. Fashion in the period 1900 to 1909 continued the long elegant lines of the 1890s. Tall stiff collars characterized the period as do women's broad hats. By the end of the decade, as you can see over there on the right, the hemlines begin to inch up. And as you can see, her dress is not as elaborately trimmed as the other two. So there's quite a transition during this period, during this decade. In yet another decade, styles were quickly evolving to shorter lengths and more elaborate headpieces. The big thing about this decade is that World War II took place between 1914 and 1919, which heavily influ influenced fashion. It was a sad era, so impractical fancy dresses were often replaced with something more practical and comfortable. Women began working and fighting for suffrage. Bridal fashion called for elaborate headpieces, however. At left is a fan-like headpiece, and a larger size bouquet, which you're gonna see a lot of. At the center, the bride chooses a shorter dress while her attendant has one with lovely ribbon trim. And at the left, we have a very demure bride with a very fancy headpiece. One of the hallmarks of the 1920s were the stunning headpieces worn by brides. And I just think these are so romantic, they deserve a slide of their own. Notice that each style is worn low on the forehead, a hallmark of that decade. Just think they're beautiful. We're now into the Roaring Twenties. And again, this decade shows widely varied hemlines, but retains the large headpieces with veils. Fashion trends of the Roaring Twenties in general included boyish, below the knee, knee drop dress, I'm sorry, below the knee, drop waist dresses like the wedding dress in the center, as well as beaded evening dresses and Mary Jane or T-strap heels and cloche hats. Dresses either drop straight down or they flared at the hip like the photo at the left. These style changes were facilitated by synthetic fabrics developed during the war years, particularly nylon, which was used in parachutes and also by the popularity of the brassiere. Although women wore structural undergarments for centuries, the brassiere that developed from the 1900s and went into mass production by the 1930s freed women to wear these different styles of dresses. We've gotten away from, from the corsets and the, and the heavier undergarments here. 
So it's opened up fashion. Okay. The 30s. The boyish look of the 1920s evolved into a more glamorous, slinkier look during the 1930s, including these wedding examples. Satin was a very popular wedding choice. Fashion was profoundly affected by Hollywood films. And I think this was the first decade where you're really seeing the influence of Hollywood. And the bias cut was very popular. You can see that in the center, center picture there. Again, large bridal bouquets are in fashion and the headpieces also vary as in the previous two decades. For the first time, makeup and shoulder pads become chic. Many weddings took place during and after World War II. Styles ranged from simple to extravagant. Classic gowns were styled like these pictured, a satin version with a tiara-like headpiece on the left, an off-the-shoulder style in the center, and a simple drape design with gloves and a short veil on the right. I think they're so pretty. These are more 40s styles. The elegance of the 40s is shown in these three portraits. The bride on the left was only 18 years old. Look how gorgeous in her flowered headpiece and veil. While the middle bride has a very simple dress with a sweetheart headpiece. And at left is another style floral veil and a high necked gown. Not all 40s weddings were elaborate, as many couples hurried to tie the knot before the groom shipped out for the war. Shown here on the left is a sailor and his bride, who chose an elaborate hat, as you can see, but a simple dress with a corsage instead of a bouquet, as did the other two women pictured. In the center, the bride opted for a blue dress with a draped bodice and a matching hat. Many wore something they already had in their closet. Now we go to the fabulous 50s. Those of us who remember the 50s will remember this popular style of bridal gown featuring a full skirt with lots of ruffles and flounces mm -hmm. and lots of lace. In the post-war prosperity, weddings now became big business. For instance, David's Bridal opened in 1950 and Brides Magazine was founded in 1959. And this was the first time that there were stores that focused solely on bridal attire. Here's more 50s fashion, because also part of that decade were shorter skirts, usually very full. These were fashion in the style of dresses worn by movie stars such as Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly. Now we're gonna to move to the 60s, which was really two different decades. Uh, a very, very decade, which included these traditional styles on the left and center. And the couture style we're showing on the right. And then we move to the swinging 60s. That traditional look morphed into mini skirts that we also associate with that era. These shown are very typical of the time period, and I still think they're very youthful and cute. I remember that as well. <laughs> the 70s. The 70s brides switched back to romantic long dresses. The fashions in the center photo are especially interesting with her floral dress and his blue suit and ruffled shirt. On the left, the bride wears a wide-brimmed picture hat and carries red flowers and her groom matches her white gown with a dark shirt and a matching red tie. The bride on the right chooses a Juliet cap. Necklines during this decade were usually high and sleeves were long. And then there's the 80s. They're remembered as the decade of wide shoulders, ruffles and flounce. Cindy Crawford is shown on the left modeling a quintessential bridal ensemble of that period with the big sleeves, a headband, and a poofy veil. At the center is an actual bride and her attendant 
who along with the girl on the left are showing the excesses of this period. We now move to the present. After the 80s, wedding dresses morphed into pretty much two major styles, the strapless ball gown and the mermaid. Managers of bridal shops will tell you that for years and years, brides would consider nothing else but these two styles. And we can't leave any discussion of the history of wedding attire without touching on faithful attendance, the bridesmaids. Look at these photos from the turn of the century when little children served as adorable attendants on the right, making me believe that this is a British wedding. And similar outfits with big hats at the right are the attendants of an American bride. Bridesmaids of the 40s, skipping ahead a few decades from that one, we see that big hats are still popular with ruffled skirts at the left and that veils came into the picture in the photo at the right. Notice the long trailing bouquets on the right. These are from the 40s and 50s. Uh, at the left are bridesmaids from the 40s in lovely blue gowns carrying matching fans. At the right, 50s bridesmaids show off their flouncy tiered skirts and short veils. Okay, I know everybody remembers this. Sherbert bridesmaids. Uh, moving ahead to the 60s and 70s, surely you remember Sherbert themed weddings where the attendants wore different bright colors. Then there were blue bridesmaids. Blue has always been a popular choice for attendance as shown in the two-tone gowns like those on the left, don't miss the big hats, and the trendy 70s culotte shown in an ad on the right. <laughs> or how about brides who opted for vivid green tones for their weddings? some with bright prints or floral capes like those on the right. Pink is a favorite color of many brides. Check out the two-tone examples at the left or the 80s flounce styles at the right. Notice that the maid of honor at the right is wearing a different color altogether, which was often a popular way for brides to distinguish their honor attendant from the rest of the bridesmaids. Look at the hairstyles. And there's purple. Some brides do opt for purple and the 70s cup, couple, look at his blue tux, uh, is flanked by girls in a purple print. While the, bodice, or the bride at the right has her attendants in purple skirts topped by white lace bodices. How about the pale yellow dresses on the right with cape sleeves and flouncy picture hats? Or the polka dot print dresses on the right with girls wearing hats that I don't know, to me look way too small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, things got worse in this photo of peachy flounced gowns at the left, definitely from the 80s. Or the floral print designs at the right that match the curtains. Or even with all of these questionable bridesmaids choices, there are some that really are worse than others. For that honor, I nominate the lady at left wearing a lampshade on her head and a big pink bow on her backside. Or the really cheesy looking outfits at left, more 80s flounces and bows in mint green, no less. And today, uh, Sarah was very, patient with me because I added some personal pictures. It occurred to me this morning how some of the pictures in my family or on my walls show these differences. Uh, I don't have a lot from way back. I don't have my grandmother or my great grandmother. The earliest one I have is my great aunt, Carolina Gregler, and she was married in um, the 1880s. I think it was 1897. This was my first mother-in-law. Her name was Margarita, but she went by Margot Garcia Pons. 
This photo was taken in 1934 in Havana, Cuba. And you can see that um, she followed the styles we saw earlier of the brides of the 30s, that they used satin and bias cut dresses, things got more slender. And this is one of my favorite wedding pictures ever. This is my parents, they're post-war uh, couple. And the one on the left is my mother in a dark colored plain dress. Again, she used a corsage. She made up for that with a great big floral headpiece. And at the left is their going away picture where um, she has some sort of a fur coat and corsage. This is my stepdaughter who did the original presentation, by the way, and did a wonderful job with it. She was married on New Year's Eve in 2006, and she wore uh, an absolutely exquisite satin gown that belonged to her grandmother, Helen Holland. Um, she had the dress uh, altered because um, they weren't the exact same stature and all, but. I can't tell you how absolutely beautiful this was, and especially by candlelight at a New Year's Eve wedding. This is me. <laughs> the 70s look with the high neckline and the long sleeves. This was in 1973, and I opted for one of those big picture hats. <laughs> Very nice, Mari. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my late husband, Jorge. This is actually my present husband's first wife. I have this picture on the wall here. Um, it's the other kind of typical 70s wedding dress, which is why I wanted to show it. She has the Juliet cap and the lace trimmed veil, the long sleeves, the high neckline. And um, Meg and I were good friends and I, I'm proud to show off her picture. Very nice. My mother is in the background shouting that she has the same wedding dress. <laughs> I bet a lot of us do. <laughs> yeah. This is my daughter that you just saw before. I don't know if she's still with us. Um, she's going to be mad at me. I'm showing her dress in a bridal salon, but it, it was the best one I could find at very short notice this morning that shows that typical look uh, of the 2000s of the strapless ball gown kind of look. And just because her face is so dark, I showed you a, a better picture of her with the tiara and veil. And almost everybody at that point was wearing tiaras. So forgive me, Rebecca. And then finally, this is my daughter-in-law, Hannah. She's the latest bride in our family. And she's wearing a, a slender, um, slim fitted gown with a, a lot of lace and beading and yet it's still very, very simple. Um, and I, I just wanted to show that we moved away a bit from the ball gown styles by 2018, 10 years later, and that's what they look like. Happily ever after. There's really nowhere to go after these slides, but I want to remind you how many truly beautiful portraits we saw through the many decades since Queen Victoria. In the end, she reigned because today most brides opt for lovely white gowns to suit their style and their personalities. And um, in these hard times when so many people are having to postpone their weddings or or trim it down to just a few people. Let's wish everybody a happily ever after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. That was, that was excellent. Since June is, is traditionally the beginning of, of wedding season, um, we're, we're excited to, to talk about, about brides of all, all sizes and all shapes and all colors um, as, we get, as we get started uh, moving into what we hope will still be wedding season. Um, I wish Maureen, thank you again for joining in to, to share your knowledge and your lovely thoughts. Um, next week, we'll be doing something completely different. Um, and I will be celebrating NEPA Gives Day. Um, it's a, don a nonprofit donation day sponsored by the Scranton Area Foundation, um, the historical site will be part of it. Um, we hope if you enjoy these programs, you'll help, you'll help contribute to the society next, next Friday on June 5th. 
Um, so Marianne and I will be doing a, a tag team program um, talking about the dirty little secrets of the Catlin House. Um, but not really, we're going to show you things from our collection and our library and talk a lot about what we do in programs that we have. Um, we just like clever titles. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be next Friday at two o'clock. Um, again, we'll send out emails and uh, Facebook notifications with the pass with the passcode for the Zoom program. Then, so again, thank you all for coming, Maureen. Thank you again for the fourth time. Um, that was an excellent program. Uh, hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank, thank you, you. Good job. Bye. Bye.